Peter, it's a, it's, it's a legitimate question why uh, anyone who's not an alumnus uh, of Bowdoin would care about the state of education at Bowdoin. Why should they? Bowdoin is representative of a very important American institution, the Small Liberal Arts College. Small Liberal Arts Colleges are one of the places in which the American elite replenishes itself in greatly disproportionate numbers. The graduates of schools like Bowdoin go on to become our lawyers or doctors, politicians. The, the ruling class of America is formed and created in colleges like Bowdoin. Especially the, uh, like the president of the National Association of Scholars? Well. You're a small college man. Yes, I attended Haverford College, I, I, a college much like Bowdoin in many respects. And uh, I'm president of the National Association of Scholars, a great and powerful organization of about 3,000 members. But uh, we're- What's the purpose of that organization? We, are, we have existed since 1987 as a body meant to push back against the radicalization and the politicization of American higher education. So we are a, a counterforce against the rise in political correctness. We fight against racial preferences in higher ed and many other issues. And so do you call yourselves conservative? No, we don't. We, we call ourselves traditionalist in that we're trying to uphold the founding values of American higher education and the founding values of our country and civilization. And so among the 3,000 some members are non-conservatives? Uh, quite a few. The last time we did a survey of our membership, uh, roughly half of them said that they were registered Democrats. Many of them uh, certainly consider themselves political liberals. Our, our board of directors includes people on the left as well as the right. Mm -hmm. And um, looking into the uh, results of your uh, very uh, uh, precise and, uh, and even longitudinal study uh, of Bowdoin, uh, one question that arises is what is it that is not being taught at Bowdoin? Uh, what is it that, um, looking at the evidence for political correctness or for a, a, a diminished uh, and less well-rounded education than, than students should have. One question is what isn't being taught. The second would be what is being taught at Bowdoin. Now, you conclude your report with this little, uh, this little stinger at the end um, about what uh, uh, Bowdoin doesn't teach, which allow me to quote a little bit from this paragraph. What does Bowdoin not teach, you ask? Intellectual modesty, self-restraint, hard work, virtue, self-criticism, moderation, a broad framework of intellectual history, survey courses, English composition, a course on Edmund Spencer, a course primarily on the American founders, a course on the American Revolution, the history of Western civilization from classical times to the present, a course on the Christian philosophical tradition, public speaking, tolerance towards dissenting views, the predicates of critical thinking, a coherent body of knowledge, how to distinguish importance from triviality, wisdom, culture. That's a pretty long list. Yes, and you'll notice that uh, there's probably uh, very few items on that list that take the form of specific courses that are missing. Uh, we say there's no course on Edmund Spencer. Uh, that has been disputed by President Mills, who says that some of Spencer's poetry is taught in some unnamed course, but there is not a course on Edmund Spencer. Um, but for the most part, the Bowdoin curriculum is a profusion of courses. Uh, since 1964, the college has doubled the number of students, but quadrupled the number of courses. Mm -hmm. So it's difficult to find specific items that are missing. But what is not so difficult to find is that there has been this change in the character of the curriculum. Things like survey courses, that effort to, of, of faculty members to say, for a balanced understanding of the broad view, these are the essentials that you must know. And by, by survey course, you mean something like uh, you know, the history of Europe from the French Revolution to the present. Yes, things like that have just uh, withered away. Uh, they used to be a fairly abundant part of the curriculum. We took 1964 as a base year. There were many survey courses then. These days, there are very, very few. Mm -hmm. uh, 
the disappearance of survey courses has been accompanied by the rise of topics courses, which are narrowly drawn courses that have a specialized character and few prerequisites. They went from a tiny percentage of the curriculum to about a third of the curriculum. But it's interesting, as you were saying um, earlier, that the students themselves don't seem to miss survey courses. Uh, did you pick up any dissatisfaction, uh, any gaps in knowledge that they were aware of, at least? No. For the most part, the students are, um, uh, take this curriculum at face value. They are uh, uh, met with a relentless barrage of flattery. The college mm -hmm. tells them from the point at which they're admitted that they are the best and brightest, that they already know almost everything that's worth knowing, that the college is there to help them follow their, their interests. Mm -hmm. now, that is the, one of the deep themes here. Uh, there was a moment in Bowdoin's history in 1969 when a new president came in named Roger Howells who uh, took it upon himself to eliminate all of the general education requirements. And since that point, you know, quite, quite a number of decades, Bowdoin has viewed the education of the student mainly is the student's own responsibility. Mm -hmm. the, the adults are there to provide a, a service, a commodity. That commodity is to address whatever it is the student might happen to be interested in. Uh, Howell's original vision was uh, that the student would develop intellectual coherence by taking a course, getting interested in something, and then building on that to the next thing. So the role of the uh, the, the wise practitioner, the learned man, the person of culture, to mm -hmm. tell the students uh, this is, in our judgment, what's important as opposed to what's less important or what's not important at all, that has vanished. Well, I'm, uh, so like most, uh, like many bad things in American life, it started in 1969. Um, mm -hmm. what, was, what was general education like uh, at Bowdoin when it existed? What, what is missing, as it were? Uh, from the earlier Bowdoin? The earlier Bowdoin explicitly in its own statement said that it believed that the purpose of a liberal arts education was to pass on to students a grasp of civilization in its broadest sense. Uh, to that end, it had a, a selection of courses that were requirements on everyone. Basically, students learned about the history of Western civilization, arts and literature and science. It was put within a framework in which things cogently fit together. Mm -hmm. So it, it wasn't random bits that accreted to one another, but uh, material presented with some due attention to chronology, to a uh, sense that uh, some areas, such as politics, supervene over other areas mm -hmm. uh, that are of uh, less commanding importance. That was put forward by uh, faculty members who were trained to be able to make the connections from one area of knowledge to another. So there was a disciplinary base that was brought into this, but an attempt by a college to uh, back away a little bit from the area of uh, academic specialization mm -hmm. and focus instead on a notion that a, a cultured, civilized American needed to possess a rounded knowledge of a variety of fields put together in a meaningful way. So it's, a, it's the best that has been thought and said. Right. Uh, it was the theme of the old general education curriculum. Now, um, uh, that would mean, too, that there would be much more students in the old days would have had much more in common in their education because everyone would be taking these gen ed courses, right. uh, not at the same time, but some, at some point, presumably, right. in their education. The students had opportunities to major in subjects and develop some of their own individuality, but there was a very strong basis of common knowledge. Any Bowdoin graduate from 1964 would know many of the same things that another Bowdoin graduate would and from 10 years earlier and from 10 years before that. So there was a, uh, an ability to link not only with your classmates in a broader conversation but across generations in a broader conversation. And, and were faculty content with that system? How did it come to be changed? Was it just through a, a president's uh, mm -hmm. initiative or was there, uh, was there resistance at the faculty level? There was resistance at the faculty level. Uh, there is, of course, a complicated story behind any sort of massive social change. The president in the early 1960s was a man named Coles, who uh, welcomed into the college 
some element of uh, we're, we want to be up to date and we want research here represented as well. So there was before Roger Howells appeared on the scene in 1969, some subterranean movement within Bowdoin to become a little bit more up to date and, and not uh, focused as it had been for most of the 20th century on retaining a classical version of a liberal arts education. Uh, that said, uh, Roger Howells is, is an interesting case study. He was a Bowdoin graduate, a Rhodes Scholar, came back from Oxford with a, a DPhil in history and a specialization on Cromwell, joined the faculty as a history professor. So a meteoric rise. I think he was 33 when he became president. But he was a man of the 60s, an antinomian spirit who in his inaugural address said that nothing based in tradition should be taken at face value. Tradition is something to be discarded. Uh, he called his approach to a liberal arts education a liberating one. Mm -hmm. And the purpose from that point forward would be to liberate students from whatever uh, residuum of tradition and culture that they brought with them so that they could rediscover their existential selves in this process of uh, So he was a Cromwellian. He was <laughs> a Cromwellian ways, that's in right. a true his sense. His antinomianism was uh, rooted in his own academic subject, in a way. If he'd had a King Charles to uh, behead, he would, we would have. <laughs> but no one was beheaded <laughs> at uh, Bowdoin, at least. No, just the curriculum. Yeah. So the, um, uh, did the faculty push back against this? Actually, quite a few of them did. And it took only a few years for the faculty, more broadly, to recognize that something had been broken, something had been lost. Mm -hmm. they, um, uh, began to recognize that students were in significant numbers taking themselves out of the uh, search for uh, broader knowledge. Their compositional skills in English were in sharp decline. The foreign languages were being shunned. So Bowdoin did what Bowdoin often does. It appointed a series of commissions. And commission after commission came back with recommendations, uh, recommendations for uh, attempting to restore mm -hmm. some distribution requirements, uh, recommendations to do something in English composition and something in foreign languages. Every one of these met with either failure or with such severe compromise that nothing really came of it. So when it came to English composition, instead of requiring students to take something like freshman English, uh, they came up with a recommendation that we're, we are going to urge students to study composition. Mm -hmm. Same thing with foreign languages. <laughs> Uh, it's just words. Right. The, when it came to uh, uh, general education requirements, they ended up creating um, uh, what they called distribution requirements, but these were just uh, basically giant lists of many, many courses. For distribution requirements, they had five. Two of them were, in effect, diversity requirements, uh, one on um, uh, international perspectives and the other on social differences or something like that. The, the notion there being that uh, uh, all the courses that had come rushing into the curriculum in things like black studies and women's studies w became the fodder for making uh, new distribution requirements. So in the, in the leveling that Howell is, uh, ushered in, mm -hmm. this dis junction between a liberal arts education and the historical content of the liberal arts, a space was opened up, and he didn't. He wasn't simply an agent of Cromwellian destruction. He was an architect of something new. The something new that came in are the things that we nowadays call the studies: women's studies, black studies, mm -hmm. Asian studies, Latin American studies, uh, later on queer studies. So we have uh, uh, part of the legacy of Howell is that once the traditional liberal arts were demolished, a, uh, a politicized curriculum mm -hmm. came in. Courses meant not to study the world or to reflect on how things are, but to change the world according to a particular prescribed end. So the, uh, what Bowdoin doesn't teach is one side of this. What Bowdoin does teach is the other. That Bowdoin does teach that there's a sort of progressive view of the West and which disdain for America and for Western civilization is coupled with a set of departments that are activist in nature and that set out the idea that 
this is how we want the world changed. But the, the, the courses on Shakespeare still exist. Courses on at least aspects of American history still exist. So it isn't as though Bowdoin has dropped uh, Western civilization. They've just made it optional. Well, um, I think I have to put that with a little bit more finesse. Uh, there are fragments of Western civilization that one can find in, say, the history department. Mm -hmm. There are other departments like government, which has uh, Gene Yarborough as uh, a prominent member of that department, one of the few conservatives on campus. That department has maintained a focus on the American founding. Mm -hmm. So uh, you can think of the old curriculum as having been put under the hammer and smashed into pieces, some of the pieces that have, are left over are still fairly substantial, but they're still pieces. They no longer are part of a coherent whole. Uh, as to whether you can find courses on Shakespeare, well, you can, but uh, oftentimes they're going to be courses taught from the perspective of queer Shakespeare, or some of them are quite good courses. Yeah. Cross-dressing are, are not Shakespeare. So, yes, yeah. uh, that kind of thing. So uh, the student who comes to the college not already in possession of a liberal arts education uh, is confronted with this uh, Jackson Pollock curriculum. And you can hunt through it and maybe find things that uh, uh, add up to an approach to Western civilization. But the idea of civilization itself is if it's uh, discussed at all, it's discussed ironically as an agent of uh, white male hegemony and that sort of dismissive sneer. Okay. Thank you.